Hey everybody, it's your pal Drew Dracy again, and I uh, got some more comics for you. And uh, you like comics, I like comics, comics for everybody. Um, Daredevil was always a favorite of mine, even though it, it sold for crap. It was a monthly series, and then about, gosh, I'm trying to think, around 146 or 147, it went bi-monthly, and it stayed that way for years until issue 172 or 171 with the uh, Kingpin, it was uh it's a now on sale monthly so it was kind of weird and it was this long plot line in the storyline about uh, uh matt murdoch's love heather glenn uh, her father was framed uh that he embezzled a company and it just seemed like the story took forever to end because it wasn't monthly but uh, with this one, I immediately noticed Gene Colan on the cover. I was like, oh, that's so cool. And I'm thinking, I oh, just did cover. You know, like, you have Kane, you have Perez, you have somebody else do the covers, but the insides would be like shit sometimes. But uh, I was excited about that. This, I friggin' hated that. 30 cents was bad enough, but you could still get three comics from it. And now you're just, just so short. If you only have a dollar, you can't buy three comics. Ah! <laughs> It meant a lot to me, you know. I didn't, I didn't, you know. I couldn't buy any everything, but uh, yeah, here we got uh, Return of Gene the Dean Colon, uh, inked by Tony Dezaniga. Wait, it's a weird, real weird combination. But Roger McKenzie was scripting this book for a while, for a good while, up until like the first year or so of um, Frank Miller. And uh, Jim Shooter is the editor-in-chief at the time now, by now. And I love the weird, it's such a weird combination. It almost puts me in the mind of like somebody like Jorge Zafino years later. And, uh, I don't, you know, I'm just throwing that out there. I'm not saying it's exactly the same, but it just has the, the shadows. It's like, it's the... The hard images are like unfinished. Really neat stuff. This is great. The Cobra is hold is killing, uh, basically choking Daredevil. Daredevil throws his uh, billy club, bounces, swack, hits him. Now the thing is, that's incredibly fun storytelling. Even though it's it's an illusion, but it could happen. It's like. He throws it, but it doesn't mean it went exactly in that order. It's just that, uh, you know, he changed the camera angle to where, it, it, while he makes the storytelling, it's brilliant stuff. So that always creeped me out, the eye and the tongue there. Ah. So here comes Mr. Hyde. And, uh, bah. That was ferocious. I remember it looked like he was going to eat Daredevil alive. Oh my god. And of course you have to have the wino who sees uh, you know something happen with superheroes and he throws his bottle away so he'll never drink again. That, that is such a big troop of the uh, Bronze Age. And um, and they still did that like into the 80s and 90s sometimes and I'm like that's so played out. Spins around, man just barely save himself but Mr. Hyde crashes the whole way. You know what else is weird? This will show you how goofy, how devoted a Marvel fan I was. Uh, for many years, the first three pages were, uh, you know, story. And then there would be two pages of ads, and then two pages of story, two pages of ads, two pages of story. But they, they mixed it up. It's like, you turn a page, and it's like, whoa, another story page. Wow, wow. And it was just all different. And it sounds so stupid, but when you're a kid and impressionable and you're you study every stupid thing about a comic is once you every comic I would buy at the time, I would finish at the end, start over again, and read it a second time. That's just uh how much of a nut I was. Thank God I got I became a comics pro or else uh I don't know what I'd be doing. So maybe time. <laughs> so Really exciting stuff. And it's like, he's trying to reach his billy club. He's a bit rattled. But it's like, it's a whole page worth of it. And it it's dramatic as hell. Ah. 
How you do die? And Mr. Hyde throws a daredevil out. Heather. Long story. And this was the other thing too. It was like this. This is a bi-monthly book, so it took years to get over the storyline where his girlfriend Heather, uh, her father uh, died, uh, and it was believed that he was a, he embezzled from his company and all this other stuff, and it just took forever to resolve. But uh, you know, good stuff. But yeah, it was bi-monthly for years. A lot of top name, uh, top tier comics were like that. Okay, now to Judge Dredd. I first found out about this from a great fanzine, high-end quality fanzine called Comic Scene. And uh, in the second or third issue, uh, I mean, they cover a lot of Marvel and DC stuff, and they also covered stuff like this. Judge Dredd I had never heard of. It had already been published like four or five years prior in the UK. And um, now it was going to be a monthly book, uh, a monthly American book. They would reprint the stories in order and uh this ballin guy was like holy cow look at this look how insane that is in a beautiful way and it starts off with the woman from the cover uh judge anderson she is a, a psychic telepathic uh you know all this you know the you know that kind of stuff and in the issue one they say issue one here but you know it's it was probably 2018, issue 17 or something, uh, the, from the original source. And she had fought Judge Death, and somehow, using her psychic power, she absorbed him into her head, but she couldn't do it very long, so they put her in this plasticine, uh, whatever you would call it, uh, shell to basically keep that demon in her. And this guy's just checking everything out. It's basically a tour. Uh, over here we have the uniform of Judge Hurst, the inventor of the flesh disintegrator. He will be remembered. That's the last tour today. Lock her up. Ah, oh, he's gone. I'm sorry. This printing really is bad. And I'm not trying to just say because I'm not a newsprint snob, but some pages just print better than others. Especially with ball and start. Come on. There we are. Not great, but, you know, serviceable. He starts, uh, he takes like a laser and starts to cut open the the plastic that's holding her. And then, free your trust. God, is that scary. And the design, too. It was weird is the, when the English, when the British invasion comics happened in the 80s, they brought so much wild, it just insane designs you know like judge dread is you know the judges are a, a crazy design you know just so many others uh that they did um it just they were outside the box you know like this character paradox and also um just just a whole bunch of them so anyway this guy heads home and he goes Jen Janie, you promised, you promised you would kill her if I helped you. We lied. So, you know, like I said, these panels, some of these are a little odd because the size of 2000 AD was more squarish. It was more like uh, when Rolling Stone magazine was out back then. Uh, it was around that kind of, you know, a different format. So they have to kind of adjust some of the pages. And uh, love that. Because it's like you'll either see his mouth open or closed, but you rarely see where it's just kind of a little bit coming out. And I've always loved Judge Dredd's profile with that jaw. Hang on. Come on, man. Work with me here. Yeah, cheap ass paper <laughs> where his uh, lower lip is always sticking out. It's like I always wanted to see somebody like try and take. Uh, a bottle cap off a bottle under his lip and that would be like the last thing that guy did <laughs> in his life just crazy shit and you know what I really like too is Judge Anderson who is uh, you know the psychic powered one I've never seen in comics a woman with a squarish jaw oh that's a great panel look at all that Whew. it's a pit up I'm going to rip it out now 
Well, I mean, it's like I had never really, I in comics anyway, you had never seen a woman with a squarish jaw, and it just adds a little more sexiness to it. You know, it's just like, uh, you know, she's not a waif. You know. Wow. Yeah, and he also gave uh, uh, Queen uh, uh, Guinevere, uh, I think from two th Camelot 3000, uh, he did, you know, gave her like a squarish jaw, and it just, I don't know, it was just really cool and sexy. Classic image here, our moment in Judge Right History, carries into the face of fear. For a moment, the icy chill of terror courses down dread spine. The shock of the gaze could kill an ordinary man. Gaze into the fist of dread. But dread is a judge. A judge is not ordinary men. So it goes on and on. It's so good. Okay. Um, okay, we're going to go to something kind of wacky. Um, Gen 13. It was a big deal when it came out. It was a few months I don't know, it was like maybe a couple of years into uh, Wildstorm, the image company and all that. And J. Scott Campbell was sort of, he started off sort of like a Jim Lee clone, but he quickly deviated from that and just really did some great figures. Like he made it his own. Like he, he had a certain way of drawing women. He had a certain way of drawing speed and action and such like that that was uniquely his. And, uh, and to that point, I felt he kind of out, he outgrew the Jim Lee influence. I mean, I was, I mean, come here, you. Come here, you. Sicken me, you. Okay, Wild Store Productions. Ah, uh, but it's an imprint of DC Comics. Okay, so, yeah, this is when Jim Lee sold out. Uh, what's really weird is that Gen 13, it's so crazy. It was so popular when J. Scott Campbell started. And he only did X amount of issues. Maybe he did a year's worth. I, I, I don't recall, but then a lot of other artists took over. And one of them was Gary Frey and Frank. And I loved his stuff on the Hulk. I loved his stuff on Batman uh, Year One, the graphic novel. No, not. It was. Uh, Oh, it was the graphic novel that was separate from all the other... Oh, Earth One Batman, that's what it was. Um, where they reimagine, you know, the origin uh, more with a more modern style. But, but one thing you can't say about Gary Frank is that he makes things exciting or draws, you know, really exciting faces and figures. He's just kind of a, a journeyman who does super good stuff but it, it's good it's not thrilling but he could draw your his ass on anything like a buildings and just all kinds of stuff and uh you know it just kind of after a while bleh. uh and then somebody else took over i don't recall but the weird thing about it is gen 13 was white hot for like a year and a half maybe but when Marvel and DC were doing the crossovers, uh, which became more and more routine in the late 90s as both companies were, were trying to stay afloat, especially Marvel that was going through bankruptcy, um, they would cro do a lot of individual crossovers, and um, Gen 13 are like in three of them. They are, they're, it's Gen 13 Spider-Man, then there's Gen 13 Generation X, which was a, you know that mutant group from the early 90s, and now we get Gen 13 Fantastic, Fantastic Four, and that's like almost as much as Batman uh, crossed over with uh, the Marvel characters, and um, and this came out. I think this is the very last one. It came out because I was starting to work at Cross Gen in 2001 when this came out, so uh, I think it might be the very last one. But uh, in a month, they're going to do an, a omnibus of all the marvel and dc crossovers so it'll probably this will probably be the last one because that's the only one i recall last uh and it's written and drawn by kevin mcguire the legendary artist and carl story who was like one of the greatest inkers of all time he inked uh, chris sprouse on tom strong he inked adam hughes a long lot he uh he, he's one of the one of the greatest inkers nobody knows about <laughs> Because he's just kind of low-key. But, uh, you know, editors know who he is. So, um, what's weird, though, is the faces are, are perfect. I mean, you could tell that he was later influenced, kind of like 
by Adam Hughes when it came to the faces and such, but he was already in the industry before Adam Hughes. The weird thing, though, is how orderly the rocks are on uh, the thing's skin. It's like usually they're different sizes and something, but he'd make them, it's like a honeycomb effect. Uh, so he, he, you know, he wrote it and uh, had a lot of fun doing it. And see, and this is a weird thing too. It's like every every little rock is the same, but you know, uh, you know, maybe maybe I'm out of touch. Uh, and then like the Human Torch, you just can't flame on. He's got to have a billion little flames. So you got Grunge, you got all these other characters, and you know they were a fun team. But it's just so weird how many appearances that they you know got sneak in a little uh, Spidey action. Really, really amazing. I don't. Ken McGuire's never done Spider-Man to my knowledge. I love those faces. He really did invent, reinvent comics as far as uh, facial expressions because for the longest time there was only like five facial expressions and, uh, you know, it's usually, you know, of... Uh, you know, laughter, anger, you know, like uh, stuff. Alan, there's a handful. Well, we can't keep, we can't let them keep Quelock. Let's just break in and bust them out. You can't possibly, you can't possibly be that simple. We're talking state of the art security and then some. Don't worry, I think I can get us in. <laughs> woot, woot, woot. And she's all coming on to him like, uh, and she's wearing like that. Like the Japanese schoolgirl outfits that uh, you know a lot of guys are have a fetish over. <laughs> Hi, John. You remember me? We met earlier tonight. I was wondering if we could talk. That's a girl you met before. Yep. Uh, if this is a bad time, I could. No, not at all. Meet me at the roof. Yep. He, oh, horny as horny gets. That's our that's our Johnny Storm. And then things get. Then there's a throwdown. It's so weird to see. Such orderly rocks on the thing. The closest I've seen to that kind of orderliness on the rocks was when Jim Starlin did the first two issues of, uh, um, oh, Marvel. What the hell was it? The first two uh, Ben Grimm team up books at the end of Marvel Feature, I think, with the Hulk and with Iron Man. But, uh, I mean, this is so. It's almost like puzzle pieces but it, it's tremendous fun and there is a alternate cover like one of thousands of references to the iconic justice league uh, number one that came out in 87 i think and it's still great you know and uh tribute to ff number one fun 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 so we go from that to the eh, pretty cool but you know big throwback uh, but I, I like it. I grew up with it. And uh, covered by Gil Kane. And inks either by Frank Giacoya or uh, Ramita. They both had a very similar ink line. Like kind of a heavy, but they would, would also like soft where it needs to be. So we got Steve Englehart who would stay on the book for another year. Uh, and then George Tuska, Vince Coletta. Um, the Wasp was injured thanks to the Toad. Uh, from last issue, I actually redid this episode because I was trying to explain how it happened last issue, and I ended up wasting like two minutes. And they're saying like, "Oh, take my word for it," <laughs> and I was like, "Ah, shit, I'm gonna start over." Well, he's having a fit. He wants to get the guy who hurt Jan, his wife. Um, there's Moon Dragon. There's Beast. They're not members yet, but they're uh, you know they're members. Uh, what do you call? You know, they're hanging out and maybe will be. Uh, World Wind, who was a human top, who was uh, Giant Man's first uh, major foe, I think. Uh, yeah, the human top. And Warwood's getting dizzy. And Moon Dragon's chasing him out. So. Oh, so now there's a new menace after Jan. It's just one long string of disasters. This is insane, insane. Super Biz is like that, though. So, um. He's experiencing pain because the Toad is a short guy and something Henry Pym hadn't done in years. No, no, no. 
excuse me, excuse me, let me straighten that out. Actually, he was Ant-Man for a while, but he said recently, uh, blasted the, the pain is back worse than before. I knew it was dangerous to shrink with that microbe that trapped me at ant size before still in my blood. I had to do it. I'm getting good at standing pain. Uh, so when he was Ant-Man a second time for Marvel Feature and then going into uh, an issue of Captain Marvel, uh, and he eventually uh, he went from being stuck as an ant to being able to go back to full size. But he was warned by his doctor, you know, cut it out, keep the same uh, height. So, uh, chauffeur for uh, Janet Van Dyne, who had been around for years and years and years and years. And the reader was always in on the uh, secret that he was the whirlwind. He goes, ex chauffeur, don't you mean? Or have you forgotten that we fired you? Uh, for, wait, for trying to defraud Jan's estate and Marvel Feature 9. What are you doing in the uniform? Well, I thought perhaps old associations would help out, sir. I only wanted help. She doesn't need your help, Charles. Not unless you're God in disguise. So says, my, we're in a snit today. So he goes back to when he was the whirlwind. And he was hiding in plain sight. Uh, he was going to sneak in, but there's guests. So there's more to go on. But Why? Why? Oh, I'm... I'm Whirlwind shows up at his place. Ants dig a tunnel to where Whirlwind gets stuck. And he goes, uh, ground the little crummy wise guy. Blame the ants. And now blame me. And Whirlwind flees. And he doesn't understand why he would flee from uh, a gun. Because it's not a conventional gun. It's a stinger gun. Uh, well, he calls check out Janet. Everything's fine. Uh, Dean Mullaney, soon to be a legendary... Uh, you know, uh, heavy hitter at uh, Eclipse Comics as well as uh, the early years of IDW. Um, you'll see a lot, of, a lot of those uh, big names, uh, Vision and Scarlet, which are still honeymoony. And uh, what are you? Can't you guess, Charles? It's taken me years to lift my nose off the grindstone and take a look at it, but tonight Whirlwind ran from a weapon very few people have ever seen. You've seen it, Charles. Yes, I have. You utter Claude. Ah. Uh, while wow, whirlwind is a oh stuff it you're growing you're not supposed to do that you think i care now this is for keeps now this is really cool to me as a kid because i had read anything giant man so it was all really fresh to me i'm like wow this guy growing and I, you know giant dudes and ant dudes are always cool <laughs> and uh even though they couldn't even though stan and the rest couldn't make it work in the early 60s uh, like, hey, where'd he go? Now he's Ant-Man getting inside his armor. Z -z 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 Zapping him a bit on his big old hairy chest. But he doubles over. He's been, his size has been abnormal too long. About to get stepped on. Bong. Sorry, that was no doubt a dirty pull. But even though YJ lets his feelings get the better of him sometimes, I could hardly let you continue. Did I tell you to stay there? But as Samuel Collins said in the 1947, 1943 Superman newspaper strip, never mind me, attend to that arch fiend. It's like, they mentioned Superman? <laughs> I thought it was pretty trippy. On the next issue, I don't have the floppy for it. It's where the vision goes inside Yellow Jacket to cure him, which is a twist on Avengers 93 where Ant-Man went inside the vision. But I'll have to get it sometime. So, all right, we go. Amazing Spider-Man. Beautiful, beautiful cover. I believe that's Romita. That is a... Look at the, I like the gradual blue, too. Really nice stuff. Really top-notch. Um, Ross Andrew, and like a billion other people, I, I didn't appreciate him at the time. The stories were so good. He told such great stories, but, you know, he had the curse of following John Romita. No matter who was going to take over, people would have a fit. Um, but Ross Andrew, he's a magician. I mean, he takes his own. He would go on. Uh, he took photos of Manhattan. He'd go all over, you know, at the top of the buildings and really give you that environment. That Spider-Man was uh, going around the city. He lands at home, <laughs> gets knocked on by the uh, landlady, 
And uh, she thought, oh my god, I killed him. Well, he's stuck down there. Gets to his apartment. Goes to get some milk. <laughs> it's sour. A lot of nice touches in here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, this is like a couple issues I kept doing this. Tease. Uh, and there's J. Jonah Jackass. I'm getting ready for the wedding. And Mary Jane has a beard. <laughs> Poor printing there. And uh, they're, not, they're just fancy. Uh, and that's another thing. It's uh, Morgans of Malverine. Ned B Leeds and Betty Bryant have been lucky enough to to book the Cupid Room for today. So that, I mean... And then sh uh, Chandeliers, man. Those are pain in the ass to ink. <laughs> they really are. Um, so... They get married and such, but I don't really care. I, I always thought Spider-Man's uh, his peer group were just like really bland and white bread. It's like Ned Leeds, Betty Brandt, uh, you know, uh, what is it? Uh, Osborne, his friend, his roommate. And they were just so bland. You know, Flash Thompson, he was just kind of like a generic dick once in a while. And uh, uh, I don't know, but uh, I've just never, I mean, you know what they were? More than personalities, they were all plot devices. And that's just my opinion. So, uh, anyway, Mirage shows up. I love the design. And, uh, well, the Mirage is Mirage Ears. <laughs> I love that. Here comes Spider Man. And look at these poses. Which is nothing. Like this. And, you know, like I say, he's moving all this stuff. You see the shadow for a second, or, you know, the outline. He, nobody can move that fast. I asked you to call me nobody, but that's atrocious pun even for me. So, look at that panel. Now, if you suckers want to tangle with me, let's try it hand to hand. Come on, Boses, I'm waiting for you. Wait, scared? Totally badass. So, they jump him. And he gives them the tilt of world treatment. One of the oh, Mirage gets through. Spider Man keeps missing him. Going up these steps. Look at, I mean, the storytelling, the degree of difficulty it would be to keep your. If you're doing it panels one after another, that's like masterclass stuff. And, uh, you know, so. At the, you know, you could say at the time maybe Spider, Spider Man, Spidey Sense could have figured it out eventually, but it was more of a chase at the time. So he goes way up to the gigantic chandelier, takes it out. So his illusion is over here, but the real one's over here. I love that he like could have killed this guy easily. It, that, that's just so. That's so wild. But, uh, yeah, you know, he'll be all right. <laughs> we'll leave, we'll leave for police. So, uh, you know, they get married. La, la, la. Bland husband and bland wife. Okay, yay. And Dr. Octopus shows up. It, it, a little uh, afterthought on all this is just so funny how Dr. Octopus, Octopus, he's like this total slob. He's got these four arms. He's routinely beating the shit out of Spider-Man and other people and Aunt May is like afraid of Spider-Man. Oh, that wretched. Where's that? Why did you wear that mask? Oh, Otto, you're such a sweet angel. And I was just kind of like, you know, I think Aunt May may need to be get 24-7, uh, you know, help. <laughs> you know, I, I just, you know, I would question her judgment at this point. So, that's it for now. I hope you liked it. And uh, leave comments below, please, please. I love that. Please hit like, like, like. And hit subscribe. And write whatever you want to do in the comments below. I, I welcome many of them. And I do not delete a single one. Even if there's a disagreement, I'm not going to treat, uh, you know, one of my viewers as like, uh, you know, as, as a creep, you know, just because we have a disagree on something. It's really not anything. that uh, It's just comics in the end, everybody. 
And, uh, well, I ran a little long, but I hope you enjoyed it. And uh, I will be talking to you again soon.